the city and the businesses and the property owners uh, during this construction process and uh, been involved with it for a long time. We have uh, a, a guest over here, Elliot Balch, who actually uh, wrote the grant to get the Tiger Funds to uh, get this project going. And uh, we were both involved with the Fulton Corridor specific plan effort and all of that, that sort of allowed all of this to happen. So there's a, a long process of you have to have a plan and then you have to uh, have a 21 member citizens committee and there's a variety of steps to go through to get any kind of a project done, especially in California. So uh, all that took a few years and then um, uh, and then so basically, like I say, we started without any plan, any money, any political support, anything else we didn't have, common sense, yeah, clear thinking, anything else. So really, when you start these projects, you have no idea what the end result will be or even if there will be an end result, because you have to put all those pieces in place. So uh, we started with the plan, of course. That's a good place to start. Uh, which didn't just include the Fulton construction project, but it also included uh, looking at land use and building design and things like that. What we found is there are a lot of things that were kind of backwards in downtown rules. Like uh, it was very hard to do mixed use where you have houses above shops. It was very hard to do outdoor dining. There was no rule that allowed rooftop restaurants. A lot of fun stuff we see happening in other cities were either against the rules or weren't in the rules. So when you went into the planning department, it made it ambiguous what they should do because they like to say, I can approve this, I don't approve that. And if it doesn't say rooftop bars or uh, tech workspace or something like that, they don't necessarily know what to do with that. So we wanted to clean a lot of that up as well. It also included a plan for the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, like Lowell, where I live, Jefferson, where Yacomi School and Jefferson Elementary are across Blackstone, Southwest Fresno, Southeast Fresno, to clean up a lot of the zoning and stuff for that those neighborhoods too, so we could help bring them up while we were trying to bring our downtown back to health. So that a healthy downtown made the neighborhoods more uh, desirable to live and having healthier neighborhoods ended up making downtown more vital so those things work together uh, so we did all of that and then uh, we had a public process on the Fulton Mall if some of you were there uh, we had thousands of people comment on uh, what they liked in terms of an option of keeping it the same just rebuilding them all because it was falling apart but kind of rebuilding it as is or if we should make minor modifications and put in some traffic all the way to should it go back to being a four-lane street like it used to be before the mall was in so uh, how many options would you guess we looked at from the beginning at the total a dozen. yeah so a dozen or so options some just opened up one block some opened up two blocks some were curvy, uh, all of that, and then narrowed it down to about three, and then um, and then finally took it to the council for a vote, uh, which we had a packed house of people and ended up getting a five to two vote uh, in support of that. Uh, but even then, what's that? But even then, the thing that was adopted got oh, through the yeah. design process. Yeah, and then. Uh, then there were lawsuits, of course, uh, so we had three lawsuits, two uh, county, state, state lawsuits, and then one federal lawsuit, generally speaking, so, and we prevailed on all of those. And then, of course, there was the, we don't have any money to do the project, and the city council said we aren't going to spend any general fund money on it, so you better get something else, and so Elliot wrote that grant. 
Uh, the first time we applied for it, we didn't get it, which really no city gets it on their first try. Most get it on their third try. But on our second try, uh, we got the money. And um, not only that, well, only about 10% of the grants are funded, if I remember right. And we got uh, a larger allotment based on what we asked for. So say we asked for 18, we got 15, 8. Uh, that was a greater percentage of our ask than any other city got that year. So it was a very successful grant. Uh, and that was really the last thing that gave the council the push to uh, go for the project, knowing that we had the funding, most of the funding. And then there was getting some local gas tax funding and um, some state funding as well. So none of the city general fund that goes to police or parks or those kinds of things could be spent on the project. So that was one of the criteria. And then, of course, it went out to bid, and uh, the council said it can't be one penny over the budget that you've allotted. And at that time, uh, construction costs were rising pretty quickly, so it came in high. And so it had to be renegotiated down to a uh, to meet the bid. So some things were cut out. Some things I think were actually good. Like there'll be more stop sign intersections and less street light intersections, which in a downtown where you have two-way streets that you want activity to kind of slow down is kind of a better way to go. And it's also really annoying when we're downtown and you have to stop at a red light and there's no one else at the intersection with you. So <laughs> that you sit and wait for no one. So this way it becomes kind of uh, regulated, self-regulated. So uh, a little bit, my background is, is mostly in downtown revitalization work. Uh, I started in revitalization in the Tower District in the 80s, uh, put together investors and bought some buildings in downtown Fresno, <coughs> Security Bank Building and the T.W. Patterson Building, and I managed those for a few years, then was hired by Pleasanton to do their downtown, and then uh, I was a little too far away from from home here, so I uh, took a similar job in Hanford, and then I became the president of California Main Street, so I got to work with 39 other California cities and see what they were doing with their revitalization, and uh, that really was a great experience, because really we should be learning from each other, not trying to make things up on our own. And then, uh, and then, couple other things, business incubator and all that, but relevant to revitalization, I uh, went to work for the city. I also teach urban entrepreneurship at Fresno State and uh, started something called the Fresno Downtown Academy, which I'd encourage any of you that like this kind of stuff to do. It's a year-long look at different aspects of downtown from last month was uh, a night focused on Chinatown and uh, next month will be a night focused on um, the Lowell neighborhood, and uh, it just it's it's building a lot of uh, more knowledgeable people in our community about what makes downtowns work and what's going on in our downtown. And the more people like you that come to learn about this stuff, the more we can get the positive word out about what we're doing and why we know it will work. So I appreciate you guys taking your time this morning. So, any questions? Anyone tired from our walk so far? <laughs> How do you do the uh, Downtown Academy you were just talking about? The Downtown Academy is coordinated in structurally through the Downtown Fresno Partnership. So in about February, uh, the next class will start. So if you uh, like the Downtown Fresno Partnership uh, Facebook page is probably the best, uh, or go on to the downtownfresno.org website and sign up for the e-newsletter, uh, then you'll hear when the applications come out. Usually there's a month or two of applications. Uh, we also do an overnight trip. It's one of the best things you could do to learn about our revitalization is go to other cities and see what they've done. So we start out by getting out of our own um, issues and opinions and go see what's happening in other places. Go we'll say hi. Yeah, right. um, I've forgotten if there's a token for the day for 
Not really, but sort of general. Uh, May will be our next focused one, and that is May is History Month. So that's coming up right around the corner. And that's been our biggest one ever, so it's kind of fun. We have a lot of other people talking besides me, which is really great. How long has the process been so far? This, yeah. getting this to happen? From, yeah, from it what It started just... in earnest in 2009. Now, there have been other starts and stops along the way, uh, but we started the planning process immediately in January 2009. So, and when were you to the point where you, could, you had a plan that you could submit? Uh, the plan, well, it took about a year to get the consultant's contract and then probably another year before we had pretty good planning. So uh, it was just recently actually adopted by the council formally last November, October. Yeah, uh, but we had enough that we could start submitting it for grants and things like that. Um, but then, you know, the environmental impact report and all that stuff and lawsuits and all that if you're going to do something, you want to start now because, you know, so by the time we have the ribbon cutting, it will be, you know, almost 10 years, nine years, something like that. Uh, which is actually pretty lightning speed for some projects. Um, okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about the layout uh, here. So this is the most complete block. Uh, from here to Tulare Street, we call the first phase of the project. And so, um, so Fulton used to be a two-way, uh, two four-lane street. And at one point, it had trolley cars down the middle. So there was a lot of activity with reasonable sidewalks for a normal downtown. Uh, then, of course, we put in the pedestrian mall in 1964. We were the second in the country to have a pedestrian mall. Um, what we studied is that what happened to those pedestrian malls around the country is that they didn't work to a great extent. Um, and that about 90% of them had already been removed by the time we started our process. So um, I like to kind of jokingly say that but we have to assume that they weren't removed because they were overly successful. They were removed generally because they were underperforming. And what we found around the country is that there are a few places where they work and they tend to be cities that don't need them, that they're okay if you're so bustling you can start messing around with blocking off traffic and things. But as a tool to revitalize a downtown or to keep a downtown healthy, they didn't work because once you put confusion in people's mind about how to get to a store they stop going there and once they're once they stop going there then that one closes and then their neighbors closes and then you set off a uh, really bad chain of economic events so 1964 it opened what we found around the country is that they all worked pretty well for say three to six years maybe eight years but even in that time, the decline started, but after about eight years, uh, they were pr pretty much all dead unless they're a smaller city or a college town or something like that where you have a built-in uh, group of people to support downtown. Um, so, when we looked at all of the options, um, the one that seemed to work the best is to have a narrower street two-way so you could still come and go from any angle you can turn right in here but you can turn in from any side you didn't have to wonder if you were supposed to start at one side or the other but also very narrow streets so that traffic slows down uh, the only thing that slows down cars is a sense of danger uh, you can put five mile an hour speed limit signs. You can put one mile an hour speed limit signs. It doesn't matter. We drive as fast as we think it's relatively safe or that we won't get a ticket. I know that's not this group, right? I'm saying other people, that's how they drive, right? 
Uh, so when you pull onto a street and it's narrow, your senses tell you, oops, it's kind of tight in here, I better slow down. And then when you see that, see that band in the street up there, that's what we call a mid-block crossing, clever, cleverly named because people can cross their mid-block. But when a car sees people there, then again, it signals that they should be slowing down. We have parallel parking along the sides here, so there'll be uh, people who don't know how to park, trying to park, blocking traffic, uh, and doors opening, and things like that. So you're really gonna get a psychological sense to slow down here more than a government regulation sense to slow down. Uh, the other trick that the designers came up with that they're seeing in other cities, it's helpful today because you can see where that water is in that gutter. The foot or so of concrete is actually measured in the drive lane. So your official drive lane, your tire can be over on the concrete a little bit or near the concrete. So uh, when this is striped, you'll still have 11 feet of driving space, which is a normal lane, but it will only look like a 10 foot drive lane, which makes you feel more constrained. So it's sort of a trick of the eye to make it feel even tighter than it is, which will make people slow down even more, which will make it safer for pedestrians and you'll also be more likely to see all the action happening in all the outdoor cafes and see a sign for a new restaurant and look inside a store window. So that's what we want in a downtown. Yes. There aren't bike lanes. That was uh, part of the compromise in terms of having street and uh, primarily uh, uh, room for the artwork and fountains. Something kind of had to give, but the other thing in a really slow moving street, we want cars to just be part of the lane. Cars, uh, bikes might actually be able to move faster than cars on the street. So that's a little bit of a problem. They take a lot of space actually. Um, so it's more a street where everyone kind of has to share it is the idea. Uh, the other, the, oh, one more thing. Uh, the other thing, Ideal in a downtown, you'd have diagonal parking, but that was another thing that gave way because of the need for the room for the art and fountains, as well as pedestrians. So there were definitely some compromises. Yes, sir. Are they going to post share the bikes to share the lane? Yeah. No, seriously. That's, they're, they're supposed to, and they're also supposed to be adding some things where the bikes will trigger the street lights without having to get up off and, yeah. I forget what they call those. What do they call those? Loop detectors, yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, are they going to be enforcing how the, the bikes and uh, cars are interacting with each other? Sharing the road, yeah. Uh, any other questions? So, um, yes, sir. Yes, the parking will be metered. Uh, so they will be able to set the meters, unlike the meters now where it's all or nothing kind of a thing, they'll be able to change it. Um, the, yes, they'll be able to take credit cards and all of that too. So it'll be more convenient. The, the, you know, the ideal would be for human beings that work in offices and shops to not park on the street all day long but we know that they do so the only way to regulate that is really to leave the parking open for the people trying to get to the businesses is either to do a time zone parking where you say two hours and then you have to have someone going around with chalking the tires or whatever or the meters in bigger cities what we found even though nobody likes meters and i don't personally like meters but I know from a downtown parking management perspective, you've got to have a way to keep these spaces open because that's where most of the business occurs. You can actually measure the amount of retail you can support by the number of on-street parking spaces that you have. The more on-street parking spaces, excluding lots and garages, the more on-street spaces, the more 
retail activity you'll have. So it's critical to keep these open. Now the other part of that is